All right. Welcome to my talk, Will ARM be the new mainstream in data center? So um, yeah, one word to myself. So I'm Toby, working for Kubernetes since mostly six years, near two. <laughs> so and yeah, see a lot of uh, common faces here. Uh, nice to meet you all. So hi. <laughs> and um, yeah, working with containers since m seven years and I'm happy to talk today about a new technology what did I discovered for for myself by switching from Linux back, or not back, switching from Linux to Apple Mac. So for me, I love to use Linux Mint. I was really in favor of it and I had a lovely Dell XPS laptop and I was really, hey, that's cool. Um, but I w still had issues with battery and this really sucks and I get annoyed and I get older and I don't want to play around anymore. So I heard about this new Mac M1 what is basically here, and there I discovered, okay, ARM hmm, on the desktop could be interesting, so I decided to switch over and um, moved also my whole environment to it. So, and I thought, okay, let's give it a try because it's new, will it work, like also will it ro run with x86 apps and so on, but um, it's an objective result, so uh, if you see it different, feel free, but it's my personal uh, result was a battery is awesome. You will survive a conference, a train. So I know KubeCon, first time I don't ch didn't charge a laptop at all. I would never give a talk with my Linux laptop here without battery. So um, this was something what was really awesome for me. Then performance. Like I intend to have a lot of tabs open. I don't know who else, but uh, like a lot of windows, a lot of tabs, and every time I, oh, please Chrome, don't crash, and uh, if I need to reopen, it takes 10 minutes, and uh, right before of a meeting, and this was like really helping me, um, because now it starts really fast, in 10 seconds around, that's really cool, and um, the device is cool, and there is no fan noise anymore. So uh, basically, there is a fan included, I tested it, <laughs> It, it takes really something to get it running, and that's really nice, and I really enjoyed it. Then Corona came, and I enjoyed the battery again, because I was moved out in a separate room because of my uh, newborn, um, and there was no TV, so I used my laptop also watching uh, Netflix and so on, and yeah, whole day watching videos and still have like 20%. So this was really like, okay, that's really a game changer for me. And then I started to use other um, apps what I normally use on the old system or on uh, Windows. And there, Rosetta and Windows on ARM with parallels uh, really is also awesome. I did some flyers for like a local party and this was an old Photoshop version on Windows, works with Windows on ARM, so I was amazed. But yeah, you will look, uh, close a lot of applications, at least if you come from Germany, because in Germany, if you type at, it will is the same combination in Windows uh, is at the combination for the at and in Mac it closes your Windows, <laughs> so <laughs> this was quite heavy, um, and uh, you may get annoyed by extra cost for tools and help, but that's not much, but you will pay it, and uh, it takes time to switch at least for me to get the shortcuts to get a different look and feel and get everything automation like. A better touch tool, for example, I can recommend to automate your workplace and how you move windows and so on. Okay, but um, yeah, and that's brought me to the thought, hey, why is ARM a game changer on the desktop? Could it be also a game changer for, um, yeah, for server, data centers and so on as we work with Kubernetes? I thought, okay, let's take a look closer. What is ARM all about? So ARM is, um, in, if we say, a simple set of instructions, what uh, called uh, RISC, and if you compare x86, it's uh, called CISC. And basically, the main difference is it's a smaller con um, set of instructions, and it has no direct memory access, so the, the, ma the data must be already on the chip and then it can proceed really fast and they have one basic instruction per clock cycle. What, why is this fast and more efficient? Um, I was thinking about the same if you're doing like things, like simple things more often, you can optimize it more better and that's the same thing they use. So basically they move the 
complex stuff to optimize for the processor due to compiling phase. So if you're compiling something for ARM, it takes longer as it takes for x86. And so basically you think, hmm, maybe that's come to my point. Go and Java. In Java, you basically deploy your source code, more or less, um, to a runtime. And the runtime makes the mapping to the uh, pro processor and to the hardware. And um, so the compile time is low, but uh, the execution time is low, uh, higher. And if you compare it with Go, you compile it already to your target platform uh, before you're executing it, so you have the complexity on the build time. And that's why it makes sense for me, it's the same why we're using Go, you reducing the complexity and you're reducing the, the speed, um, not you do. we have the speed and the execution and not on the compile time, because the compile time doesn't matter. And the power, the same thing, you make it more simple, you can more optimize your battery, you can optimize how the processor is interacting to reduce your power consumption. And that's what they did. So, and um, yeah, so what we also see is the pricing. Like, not so complex chips means I can produce the chips more, uh, more cheaper, and that's why they use often in IoT device or in mobile phones. At x86, mostly you're using for desktop and server applications in the past, but I would say it will may change. And now, why? Uh, if you see here on the ARM website what is already supported or who is working with the ARM technology, it's quite heavy. So we at Copomatic also implementing on and have implemented already ARM support, just not officially because we are not so good in uh, going into official programs. <laughs> um, but um, because we are a small company, that's why. But um, you see a lot of ecosystem is there. And also the major hypervisor are there. And uh, this brought me to the thing, okay, let's inspect a little bit more. What are the promises? So maybe you heard, you save energy, you save power, but what exactly are the promises from like, a, so in this example, AWS say, yeah, you can run a broad set of workloads. So you can run application server, microservices, databases, and high performance computing, I was okay, that's quite interesting. Then you have, uh, you can optimize costs, so save uh, up to 20%, okay. Um, and uh, like the price, price only, like with, if you have the same CPU, same memory, you save 20% only on the instance cost, no matter what's running there. Um, and um, sustain sustainability goal, so up to 60% less energy. And you see energy will be more and more a cost factor, at least in Germany, for sure. For all others in Europe, maybe as well. <laughs> but um, uh, this is getting more critical. And um, yeah, what are, uh, what are people doing? So like Datadog, you know, Datadog doing uh, monitoring, have a SaaS offering, a lot of data to process. They say they surfing now with identical number, of course, a lot of more customers. So that means really like you can scale your business, you can get more out of that what you're paying, and that's every month, every hour, and so that's, I think it's make worse to take a look in it. And then um, I searched further, and I was then really like surprised, like Iris is like a data platform, however, what they are doing, but they uh, have 40% better price performance to the performance, of course. So that's 40% what I can save infrastructure costs. And this um, was, 2020. So I think now we are may already more efficient, but it say already started 2020 to move to ARM. So I was not expecting that. And then um, I found a post about uh, Azure. So the ARM services um, get introduced in uh, 2022. So in there, say say providing 50% better price and performance. Okay, that's all may marketing numbers, but you see it quite, uh, there is a chance that you're getting more performance out of your um, cloud cost or on-premise. And here, um, what is one take is Gartner predicts 2025, so next year, um, that uh, top three criterion to cloud purchase will be the decision how much energy or carbon emission you have. If you're thinking about that, it could make sense as you see like a lot of uh, companies want to go green and want to go be uh, reducing the footprint. And there was also some statistic that a lot of the energy what we uh, consume are based on cloud costs or uh, data centers. And that's why I think this will be a thing. But I am like more statistic as marketing. So, well, 
then it depends in IT, it depends every time. So <laughs> be aware, statistics is just a snapshot. So if you want to make your own opinion, test it with your workload. Um, and But there are some, I would say, predictions what you can see. So there um, on a blog post, so if you download the slides, you, you find the link, say compared AMD and um, Intel with the, no, with the ARM processor and with different benchmark tests. And there you see, like here really, like $10, um, I think it's per core, to, to $5 per core is like 50% what you can save. If you may running just one WordPress instance, okay, you don't care. But if you are, I came from the uh, upper talk, how many cores was it? I don't know. Uh, two millions. <laughs> um, it may make sense to think about if I can save here uh, resources. And um, same thing, layer stack saying, so it's the next big thing. Um, we have twice the performance for the same um, amount of power and uh, like half power uh, needed for the same um, compute. And that's kind of also makes sense on premise. If you think like on-premise data centers consume a lot of energy, you may need less machines, you may need less maintenance, so it will sum up a lot of costs. And that could be really something to think about if it made not sense also like for mid-sized companies already to take a look if I may change my data center to some ARM specifics. And how we can do this? Um, yeah, Kubernetes can help us because Kubernetes already abstracted infrastructure and already abstracted also the platform underneath. So basically, I would say Kubernetes is more or less now the cloud native operation industry standard, like a cloud OS, where it's native, I don't, I can go to every customer and if they have Kubernetes, I understand what they are doing. And that's one of the big um, pluses what we have now. And if we go back, why so was the successful containerization? So this brings us um, back to ship containers. So really, they have the same anchor points where you can move containers around, but they are different. Maybe the ARM container is more like an open top container, and uh, the x86 is a hard top container, but it doesn't matter. We can use the both for the same anchor points. And that makes sense. Uh, I can run the same stuff in different environments just knowing the right interfaces. Okay, and then, how I can achieve my target state. That problem is already solved with Kubernetes because we have, with Kubernetes, we have uh, infrastructure where we say, hey, we want to run that one. The reconciler takes care that we run it and then we, we reach the state. So this is already solved. So we don't need to solve this for ARM. But data centers, I know data centers are scary. <laughs> Who running his own data center? Yay. <laughs> At least, you know, there's storage, there's network, there's cable, there's backup, there's a lot of, um, yes. <laughs> and we want to run it and that's, we have multiple data centers and then maybe that's not enough because we are in a manufacturing, we have maybe edge devices where we read out sensor data or something. We have cloud providers because, hey, fancy AI, we need to have this. Um, and all this must be consumed and managed. And therefore, um, we have to take, hey, we can scale this and we using Kubernetes as standard for it. So we run, want to manage everything with Kubernetes because if you know your ecosystem, you are be fast in doing that, you be are fast in, in maintaining it, you can use the same kind of dev DevOps engineer for edge applications for AI uh, management and uh, data centers. and. With ARM, it's the same thing. So, and I thought, okay, let's evaluate this. Because, yeah, in theory, everything is easy. <laughs> and now uh, I started my home lab. So, um, first thing was, okay, I was one serious empty cloud cluster for that. Uh, we at Chromatic have our platform where we deploy some monitoring stack, uh, not much workload, but just to have really empty cluster and see if they're already different. And here, um, what is different when I Create a cluster. I just choose another node type. So in our case, it was um, on AWS. Just use a different node type, and you see already here, 0 0.38 dollars to 0 0.4 dollars is already cheaper. Um, um, the price of just the machine itself. And then I compared basically 
what is the uh, consumption difference if I just have an empty cluster. So on the top we see x86, uh, we have basically a an CPU usage of uh, 356 millicores and we have a memory usage of uh, 3 gigabyte. And on the downside we have ARM, so we have here 186 CPU millicores and we have um, 2.6 gigabyte of RAM. So already like 47% less CPU and 12% less memory only by the simple node with two CPUs in 4 gig RAM. Basically what is running there, there are some Prometheus agents, Celium, uh, some helpers, I would say, in basic infrastructure. So, and that was like, okay, surprising, um, but I wanted to get more workload in it to see it really how it behaves. So that's why I choose my home lab and yeah, First, I needed to find hardware, and my wife's laptop was like, oh, it's so noisy. I say, okay, no worries, I have another uh, uh, use for it. So I placed it in my uh, new uh, nice rack and put the cable on it, uh, installed Linux Mint on it, and installed Kubernetes on it. And then, uh, thanks to Kubernetes, I get one Raspberry Pi 5 or sponsored, $110, so it's really <laughs> nice. Um, uh, you can run it there, and now let's compare. So uh, what I wanted to, to play there is I wa have in mostly exact hardware, um, four CPUs, eight gig of RAM. Uh, we installed there on each a Kubernetes cluster, which is a single node, untainted with plain vanilla Kubernetes. I use Cube1, that's our open source tooling for if you just want to spin up a quick cluster and deploy it a home automation. So Home Assistant, Mosquito is an MQTT thingy, and a Prometheus Operator for monitoring locking and so on. So simple application, but I would say it's nearly close to something like what you see in the IoT space. So you have also there MQTT, you have some application to working on top of this data. Home Assistant has also data uh, like included where you have uh, like really a constant data flows and that's could may compare it to a real workload already. So yeah, and what we then need there to deploy it is ARM containers. So may you think ARM containers are super hard to build? I can say you it's not because it's already included in the OCI uh, spec. So basically you can you, uh, just start with your current Docker file. You just need to build it on an ARM machine. That's the simplest way. And then see if it fails or not. <laughs> but um, if you're using may not super, I would say super weird packages or already it can just run out of the box. Um, or you can specify what I would prefer, the dedicated platform with the dash dash platform statement in your file and then you can also use it. So let's see how this looks like. So it's get maybe complicated with the microphone. So let's try it. Um, so. Here uh, we see now this Docker file, so simple Docker file from Ubuntu, and I specify here the platform ARM64. I say, um, yeah, basically install Apache 2, and give me an output, and that's it. And basically, if I now want to build it, um, okay, can you hear me without microphone? Is it working? Okay, I try to um, talk loud. Okay, then uh, let's go there. So basically here, if I just build my first simple image, it's basically just a Docker command. I know you have other toolings, but basically build the current Docker file and there you go. So basically, I already built it before, but it's downloading um, the Ubuntu ARM image and then it's starting to up install the Ubuntu ARM packages and everything runs. And I can now also say, okay, inspect, and this gives me the hint how it was working. So you see here the architecture is here ARM64. So basically the OCI standard already has the information what architecture you're running for. So this is really cool. And if I want to deploy it now for AMD, for example, the nice thing is with the Apple Rosetta integration, I can build their um, IAMD64 containers and ARM containers on the same machine. So this Docker desktop, they did a really great job. Uh, basically, we can build both things. And if I now take, in the uh, take a look here, in the architecture I have AMD64. 
So that's basically how I create different kind of architecture images. But if you now will pull it, um, the, uh, the kubelet or the, the container engine will not know what architecture it does. For that, you need to create like a meta manifest what matches what container to use. And that's the next step you will need to do. For that, I would say I, yeah, I would build the image as more as I would do in work. So I have an architecture flag where I say, okay, please define the architecture. I using it from, and I use the base image. And basically I want to give out here hard coded into the code what architecture I run. Because if I'm running my own code, I may have different approaches, uh, whatever, just proofing that I have different images. And um, then I have wrote a small make file of basically get the input and it looks some magic. No, it just builds the image and runs it locally. And then I can show you how this will look like. Um, so we have here make docker run local. And you see then here now I have uh, oh I was wrong. I can now curl and I get a AMD sixty four container image. So now let's change it to some ARM and we want to have something special. it so we're building a new image and I say also here 2024 so building a new image and that's based on arm so I can now say um, architecture arm 64 make docker run Okay, I need to stop this one first. <laughs> okay. Okay, now we run it that one. And if I curl again, I see, okay, I get now our arm image uh, in the, this, this reject. And that's uh, how it basically works. And the same thing I can now use for Kubernetes. So uh, for that, I now need this meta manifest. This meta manifest is also nothing what is really hard. It's basically just linking two different images with one meta manifest where you say, okay, this is uh, two manifests or two images together bind. And if I now uh, releasing it, I can say make Docker release multi arch. And um, then I building both architectures pushing it and creating then in the very end step a manifest with the same tag and so on. And then it's get pushed now to, to Quay. And on Quay, we already see then the image. So we have on Quay then here a web server AMD and web server ARM image and this one. And this is basically not a real image. It's more like a meta manifest what is referencing to the other two images. But I see here that I have lin Linux on AMD and Linux on ARM. So normally also the other tag should appear quickly. So the request 2024. So it may take a little bit more time, but basically then you have a meta manifest and you can just use that one to deploy. So, okay, now it's pushed, nice and so you see now the new tag, and we have here Linux on AMD, Linux on ARM. So that's basically then everything what you need. Basically that image you can run on ARM and uh, AMD machines. So let's deploy this. Um, here I have a Raspberry Pi cluster. Deploy this on that one. I have a small statement as well. So you see it here, we just deploy the normal meta image as a web server example and exposing it in the same on the top where I have my AMD. Um, and then I basically can, I need the service and I can curl my node here on the node port. 
with that port and I should get here my new brand new image with ARM. So ARM rejects 2024 container and on the top basically the same. Then this port, and here you see you're getting the AMD one. So basically, this shows this is transparent to the needed order container manifest already abstracted. That's what I really need to do. All right, cool. Then um, what? Thing, one thing more. So basically, now in whoops, this we want to go now. Um, now we can uh, take a look in my home automation. So in the home automation, this is running on just uh, two clusters. What you saw already, we have um, now the uh, we have now the UI running on both sides. So you see here now I am up, um, producing today 29 uh, kilowatt uh, of power, and I have connected my. Um, my inverter to see the lights. It's a funny thing. If uh, I ask the inverter from two instances, I only get part of the data of regards to mod switch. I don't know. I'm also <coughs> pretty deep in it. But it's <laughs> if you touch on one instance, what querying the data is fine. So here on the right side, I have hybrid. It's like a dynamic uh, electricity power provider where I get the data. So both is running here on Kubernetes. I have one instance. It's, uh, that's the Pi one. And I have instance what is the normal one. So it's quite similar data, and that's what I want to compare now. So the comparison uh, on data is now what I want to show you. Here um, we have the pie on the left and right. We have the okay, until it say got away. No, um, we have in here we see already at what was surprising in the home automation that here basically the CPU is around zero <laughs> and here we have quite a lot of more stuff so it's not much but it shows already okay um, it's less um, the most funny thing was I didn't change any of my Kubernetes manifest or anything of the code of the application and that was out of the box working on both platforms and that was really why I say okay that's not really nice and the next thing was then Mokito this is like the MQTT broker, so m more or less um, like where you get messages in and out. This is basically the same CPU usage, so I would say at least you will not use more CPU. And uh, the last application basically is our uh, monitoring, and this was really interesting, I must say, because here I really see a difference in the plain uh, Prometheus stuff. I have around one point, uh, 0 0.1, and here I have mostly around, I don't know, I would say, 0 0.25 CPU shares and we have less memory. So we have here around one gig and we have 1.5 gig. So it, it's not much right now, but if you compare it to the scale, if you calculate it up, it can make a huge <coughs> difference by exactly the same workload, exactly the same um, application. And uh, in the end, you already see it in the cluster. So that's then the cluster scope where you see have here uh, 0.25 CPUs uh, and here on the top we have like 0.7 I would say in the average so it's already is like really a difference and that's uh, yeah basically was my result so I would suggest to you like do it with your own applications to get out your stuff and here we see also on the load and the CPU it's still loading here 0.10 and um, yeah here you will have 0.25. Sorry. So then, last words. Um, I'm not used to this microphone thing, <laughs> but um, here in the slides you will also get the data. Um, here we see that is the CPU is much less on the ARM side, so I really was surprised that it's so much already in a simple use case. So my final thoughts are, Adaption of software is already given. Like everything I tested out with third manager, I tested out Ingress, I tested out all the self-helper stuff, is already there. So a lot of stuff what you may use daily are there. 
Um, you use ARM in these containers in Kubernetes is just awesome because it's super transparent, it just works. If it not works, you may need to find the image or need to build it by your own, but anyway, it's still easy because you have the interface already, but you need to test and evaluate per use case would be my recommendation. And I think we will get more ARM processes. Why? We have the growing use of Kubernetes, Edge, and container technology, and we will deploy Edge stuff in the same way we as we will do it in cloud because of complexity. The same will be the cost saving if someone recognized, oh, I can save, let's say, 20% of my cloud costs or something like that. People will like, take a look at this. And you get pressure, like use more energy, more efficiency. So this will be thinking, okay, how we can reduce stuff, optimize stuff, and this bring, uh, in my take, ARM to the data centers. I don't know if we have still time for questions. Sorry, uh, was you the first You could take a question, I think. One, okay. Otherwise, I'm still around, so you can come to me. Um, you said that you did all of this on a Pi, right? On a Raspberry Pi. Have you tried using, um, you know, the Ace Rock or any of the Ampere uh, dev, dev boxes where you could get a whole lot more CPUs? No, um, I didn't. I would love to talk to you about that. <laughs> Um, I didn't since I, I the non graviton one. Every other one is made by us. Okay, so yeah. I would love to talk to you about that. So. Okay, sure. <laughs> just no, so uh, but um, I'm not here to plug you. This was. I was just curious. So it is only the Raspberry Pi that's currently that what, four, yes. four CPUs, and you got such a big difference in this. Yes. Wow, that's awesome. And I think it's in bigger devices will be ch much more. Um, and to be honest, it was the. The uh, Amazon Prime uh, delivery, what makes the difference? <laughs> but yeah. for my case. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, but I see a lot of use cases like we're talking to manufacturing companies who want to place such boxes to their manufacturing machines and so on. And there it may say need more workload. I think also AI stuff can run on that. So we saw. Also, uh, like um, TPU stuff with that technology, I, but this will be the next step to to explore this more. So, but um, yeah, I was really surprised that the small thing is like better in the performance and uh, like as my laptop. And uh, thank you, yeah. Tobias. Awesome. Okay, thank then you. thanks.